Okay, let's get started. Welcome and thank you for joining our Agile Live webinar series on how to achieve business agility at the portfolio level. My name is Claire George and I'll be hosting today's event. Delivering complex programs on time and on budget is a major challenge for many organizations. Businesses are wrestling with how to identify, prioritize and select which opportunities are the most promising and then how to ensure consensus of vision and tactical execution to fully support the implementation of these business priorities. There's growing interest around how agile approaches can be used at the portfolio and program levels to achieve this more effectively. It's clear from the volume of questions submitted in advance of this presentation that this is a hot topic for many organizations right now. I think the question that captured it best for me is the attendee amongst us today who asked, when Agile is taken to this level, does it all just end in complex spaghetti? It's certainly a lot to get your head around. So to help us answer this question and make sense of it all, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Mike Kottmeyer from Leading Agile. Mike, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me, Claire. So our goal is for you to leave today's session with a solid understanding of the fundamental concepts of enterprise agility. And then next week, Andy Powell, Product Evangelist here at Version 1, will show us how to actually implement these concepts using Version 1. Before we get started, I would like to quickly review a couple of housekeeping items. This presentation will last for approximately 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. For those of you who haven't used GoToWebinar before, you will notice at the top of the control panel on the left-hand side, there is a button with double arrows. You can click this button to collapse the control panel during the presentation so it doesn't interfere with your viewing. All of your lines are muted throughout the presentation, so if you have questions, please send them in using the control panel and at the end of the presentation we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Many thanks to all of you who submitted questions in advance. During the course of Mike's talk, most of these questions will be addressed and then we'll try to cover any remaining questions at the end. Finally. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will send you an email in a day or two with a link to view the recording of today's event. So on that note, let's get started. Over to you, Mike. Okay, excellent. Claire, I think you got to hand me control. There we go. Excellent, everybody. Okay, very cool. So um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. It looks like we've got a, a pretty good turnout. Um, this is a bit of a reprise of a, of a talk that I did at Agile 2012 um, by the same title, Agile Program Portfolio Management. challenge here today is that I've got about half the time um, to do it. So I've taken out some of the slides, and we're going to blow through some introductory concepts here pretty quick. So if you guys can bear with me, I'm going to try to spend about the first five or ten minutes just laying a little bit of a foundation for, for what we're talking about. About here, um, you know, one of the big things that we're trying to get off um, with this with this idea is that, um, w you know, Scrum kind of forms the foundation of Agile at the team level, but what we want to really talk about is what does Agile look like when it gets into larger, um, more complex programs and portfolios. And, and Scrum's underneath it, but one of the things that we're going to start to learn is that we're going to need a broader set of approaches really to do Agile at scale and to achieve um, true business agility. So with that, um, uh-oh, where's my uh, context here? Bear with me. Uh, there we go. Okay. Well, that's a picture of me in case anybody wants to see me uh, right after running a 10K race here in Atlanta last year. That's my contact information if anybody would like to um, get a hold of me. Okay. So before we start, the, the thing that I've, I've got to tell everybody is that um, the, this, the ideas and the processes and things like that that we're going to be talking about today is not necessarily a process overlay for your existing organization. Um, there is a, uh, there's a talk that I do in, uh, usually in parallel with this, or at least some concepts that I talk about, that really talks about how to adapt your organization to be kind of, the kind of organization that can take advantage of Agile methods. And one of the things that we, we talk about a lot in that segment is the idea of organizational transformation 
new practices, and then culture. So your org really needs to be structured around the idea of teams, whether it be scrum teams, uh, you know, product owner teams, portfolio teams. We want cross-functionality at almost every level of the enterprise. You know, we need really solid agile practices um, at each of those levels. Our practices need to include the stuff that we understand in Scrum, but we also need to understand Lean. We need to understand Kanban. And then finally, if the organization really, um, you know, hasn't really gotten its head around the idea of small batches, limiting work and process, uh, managing to bottlenecks, um, understanding constraints and stuff, uh, it, it, these are tough ideas. So there's some stuff that, that you know, your organization needs to do to be able to take advantage of this. There's competencies that need to be developed. Um, you know, Agile talks a lot about the idea of planning on two to three week, four week increments. Um, we, we have to understand that, that to do real solid program and portfolio management, sometimes we have to take a longer view, not even just release, but what, what is our strategic strategic view. We're going to talk about some patterns for dealing with that. And then we also have to understand that the idea of Agile at scale. So um, again, this notion of teams uh, at the execution level, um, you know, teams at the product and portfolio level, um, and then teams at, at kind of the enterprise strategy. So again, cross-functionality at, at, every, at every step. So let me talk a little bit about um, how I see the difference between prog projects, programs, and portfolios. And so when I think about agile project management is, is largely we've been talking about this for the last 10 years or so. I really think about a team-based approach. I've been uh, involved with several, several certification programs in the agile space, the PMIACP, some stuff with the DSDM consortium. And whenever we've defined um, agile project management, we've always talked about this, this notion of a team or maybe a couple of teams working together. When we're talking about the idea of program management now, what we're fundamentally talking about is the coordination of teams to produce integrated deliverables. So a, a program team might be responsible for this coordination, but a program team is, is probably also responsible for the ongoing health um, care and feeding of maybe a product line, something like that. When we talk about portfolio management, now we're getting up into a level where we're, where we're discussing um, the investment mix and which projects are selected and how we're going to do uh, resource allocation across the entire organization. When I talk about enterprise portfolio management, now I'm getting beyond the product delivery part, and I'm thinking about where does uh, strategy happen, what's all the upstream stuff, what's all the downstream stuff around support and operations, DevOps, all that kind of thing. Okay, so we've got the notion of project management, um, program management, portfolio management, and then maybe even enterprise portfolio management. So it's, how is Agile... Uh, program and portfolio management different um, than maybe what we would say is team-based Agile. The big problem that we're trying to solve is we're trying to get business agility in the large. Uh, um, nobody really cares at the end of the day about uh, team level agility. It's interesting. Um, it's, it's something that, that is an essential subcomponent of what we're doing. But what we really need to do is on quarterly boundaries or, or whatever the, the planning horizon for your company is, we need to be able to inspect and adapt and, and respond to market changes as we go. So when we talk about program and portfolio management agility, um, it's less about the team level stuff that we've been dealing with, um, although that is absolutely an essential component of what we're trying to do. Okay, so here's the stuff that I want to talk about that's kind of foundational. So uh, why would in a portfolio talk we talk about the notion of agile teams? Well, the, the reason why I want to introduce this idea of, of agile teams is because you would be surprised how many folks are doing this wrong or poorly. The idea behind an agile team is that it has everything necessary to deliver an increment of value. So in Scrum, we're talking about analysts and developers and testers, Scrum masters, team leads, product owners, all that kind of a thing. What, what that is really saying at the team level is that, is that the entire value stream required to create the product is encapsulated within that team. Okay? So the team has everything necessary that it needs to build an increment of the product. The challenge that we're finding with organizations at scale is that it takes way more than six to eight people to deliver an increment of value. Said another way, what that means is that the value stream is broader than a single team. 
So when we're talking about enterprise program portfolio management, one of the fundamental things that we're trying to nail is how do I coordinate effectively the output of multiple teams that have to come together over time to deliver a more complex um, product. Okay, so that's the big thing, right? The team is not a sufficient construct. Now we value teams at every level. So we talked about program teams and portfolio teams. Maybe a program team has, um, you know, its value stream encapsulated into a single team entity, or the portfolio team has its value stream encapsulated into a single team entity. But that's different than what we're talking about at the Scrum level. So I'm going to explain that a little bit more. Another thing we talk about in Agile quite a lot, and this is going to be really a key concept for later on in the presentation, is that where most traditional um, program and portfolio management, project management for that matter, starts with the notion of scope. So we define what we want to do, and then we derive time and cost. Well, what Agile has intentionally come along and done, um, especially at the team level, is it's flipped that thing upside down. And it said that you know the time box, the sprint or the release, is really what we're managing to. The fixed team size that we're familiar with, you know, keeping Agile teams together, is really the cost side of the equation. And so what Agile came along and did is it said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to fix time and cost, and we're going to vary scope, <clears throat> excuse me, to maximize the value that we produce at the end of that. Um, of that delivery. In smaller organizations that are doing more exploratory kinds of work, sometimes that will get expressed as, well, we're going to deliver the most value that we possibly can, right? Product owner can, can decide to stop or release anytime they want. Again, in more complex organizations, um, a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to um, figure out how to tailor scope so that we meet the business objectives again. But again, we, we've got this challenge of having to coordinate with other people in time. We've got dependent We've got bottlenecks that we've got to deal with. Okay, so we're still going to try to manage at the program and portfolio level to this notion of fixing time and cost, but varying scope and doing it in a very integrated way across multiple teams. So let's go just a little bit deeper into this idea of what I mean by managing variable scope. Um, one of the things that I find when I'm talking with executives about this is that a lot of our common language in the Agile community around getting as far as we can possibly get within the time and costs we have drives people nuts because um, executives tend to want to know um, with some level of certainty what they're going to get for their money. And again, right now we're dealing with longer planning horizons and coordinated efforts. So how do we manage scope? in a responsible way. Well, um, one of the things that I've adapted from Jeff Patton's approach to story maps is this idea of starting with large epics that are um, groups of features and groups of user stories that are typically about one to three months in duration. Nothing magic about that. That's just a rule of thumb um, that I use um, when, I, when I talk to folks about this. So what we want is that we want to be able to commit to the organization at the epic level. Right? So the big thematic things that we want to build, we have to be able to nail. We might even want to be able to nail them three, six, nine months out. That's typically the planning horizon that most organizations need to be able to run their businesses effectively. But we're going to decompose those epics into smaller epics or features, um, call them here, you know, that, that are probably bigger than a sprint. Um, you know, they're probably less than a, a release. Um, things that you know, product owners care about putting into their product. And then the, um, the notion of a user story, of course, right? the smallest increment of value, those tiny little things that we build and that we like to put into our, our Scrum backlogs. The interesting um, notion here is that if we're going to commit to epics, and we want to get a pretty high level of confidence about our features, we need to be able to get this stuff decomposed, um, get it estimated, and figure out what is absolutely minimally marketable. Okay, so this, we're still in the context of this idea of varying scope to meet time and cost constraints while maximizing value. So one of our core underlying concepts of uh, enterprise program and portfolio management is that we always want to focus on building the smallest solution, the simplest solution that's going to actually solve our business problem. So within minimally marketable, we're always thinking about the smallest set of user stories that deliver the value 
in the feature, ultimately reducing the size of the epic and increasing the value that we can put into the market as fast as we can. This is also a strategy for minimizing risk at the team level and at the enterprise level. The smaller that we can make the increment that we're, we're trying to build, the, the greater the chances that we have of actually meeting our time and cost constraints um, when, we, when we get to the, to the end of the release. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do over the next few minutes, um, probably this will take us really to the end of the talk, is we're going to talk about four essential views that, that I've discovered um, are necessary to really um, do effective program and portfolio management. So we're still kind of in the small at this point. What we what we're want to talk about, the first essential view, is that um, we need to understand velocity and burn down at the team level. Now, why is, is team level velocity and burn down such an essential component of doing agile at scale? Well, remember, one of the things that we're trying to do is to coordinate value across multiple teams. And if we, in order to coordinate value across multiple teams, the agile teams need to be more predictable um, and more stable than, than nece we necessarily put emphasis on when it's just kind of a single team project. When it's a single team project, if our scope is off and our velocity is, is highly variable, um, you know, sometimes that's a problem, sometimes it's not. But when we're trying to think about three to six to nine month roadmaps, what we really need to do is to focus really hard on the idea that teams need to be able to look at an integrated backlog and they need to be able to nail what their velocity is over time. So, you know, this is all straight scrum stuff. You know, we're breaking things down into tasks and we're moving tasks across the board and, um, and we're, we're swarming around things to stabilize our velocity over time. Okay, so as an agile program and portfolio manager, not as a scrum master or product owner or a team member, um, what I care about is that a team can establish a stable velocity and be able to um, relatively accurately um, commit to high level milestones a little bit further out than normal. Because program and portfolio management is going to integrate those milestones into um, connected holes. So again, the essential things, this is all straight out of kind of the Scrum uh, textbook. We want sprint burndowns, we want velocity trends, we want release burndowns. All of this in an effort to help teams become more predictable over time so that they can integrate tightly with all of the other teams around them. Okay, so this is all pretty basic stuff. The next segment here, I'm going to spend just a, a little bit more time on, and I really wish you guys could ask me questions in real time and we can talk, and I guess you can through the, uh, through the, the UI, but um, uh, yeah, we're, it'll be difficult to interleave this, but this is an interesting concept for me. So one of the things that I like to talk about is the roadmap over time and why that, that is so important. So let's look at the planning horizons associated with Agile at scale. Okay, we're way less interested in the notion of sprints, and we're more interested in the notion of quarterly releases. Again, most of the companies that I work with, it's an absolute business requirement that they can be highly predictable about three to six months out. A lot of them would like 9 to 12, but realize that the further that you get out in the planning horizons, that the less accurate it's going to be. So you've got this notion of road mapping. And so if we go back to kind of our epic um, feature user story decomposition, I think it's reasonable at the program and portfolio layer to say, you know what, we've got a pretty good idea of what we need to do um, uh, between now and the end of the year. One of the things that we talk about at this level um, and what is the challenge is this idea of, well, okay, Mike, how do we know what we can commit to at the epic level if we don't really know how big this stuff is because we haven't fully decomposed everything? Um, so we're going to answer that here in just a minute. So the idea is, is that we've got epics at the at, you know quarter over quarter. Um, the other thing that we want to do at the roadmap level when we're talking about enterprise program and portfolio management is we want to have an architectural roadmap as well. Why do we need a product roadmap and an architectural roadmap? Well, these things go really hand in hand because the idea, again, is that we're fixing time and cost and we're varying scope. 
One of the things that we want to know is we want to understand how the product roadmap and the technology roadmap integrate so we can start talking about risk and we can start managing uncertainty and we can start doing a little bit of forward planning to make sure that all of the pieces and parts are integrating the way they're supposed to. So in the current quarter, um, I might understand at a pretty um, high level what my features look like. Um, a quarter out, um, I might have a pretty good idea. Three quarters out, yeah, maybe it's starting to break down a little bit, but we have got a pretty good high level. Um, in the current quarter, one of the things I strive for when I'm dealing with integrated teams is a, a really solid two to three month backlog. And so if you look at this, what we're really talking about is this notion of progressive elaboration. So in the current quarter, we know a ton about what's coming down the pipe. And so this is you know, a requirement of, of program and portfolio management that I don't think is necessary a requirement of every you know, single team or small company kind of agile implementation. The further out that we can kind of get good at seeing what we're doing, um, the, the, more, um, the more we can anticipate the unknowns. And so the one thing that is really missing from a lot of agile implementations at scale is this notion of how to deal with risk. Because we're always, as, as agile teams, wrestling with this idea of um, how do I know how to estimate something when I haven't been in it, when I haven't figured it out. Um, at the team level, we talk a lot about spikes. So we might put a, a user story in this sprint to go figure out something that we want to build into the next sprint. That is a way of making sure that we're protecting the invest criteria and that we're only bringing in well-groomed user stories into the current sprint backlog. But I would suggest that the, at the program and portfolio layer, we have to think along those lines too. So when I'm dealing with risk at the enterprise level, now I've got epics that break down into features. I've got features that break down into user stories. But now, because I've looked a little bit further ahead, I can start anticipating risk. I can start dealing with the, the things that I know and the things that I don't know. Um, I had this, um, I'm being really careful about telling you guys stories because we, uh, we, we don't have a, a tremendous amount of time for this presentation. But there was this one release planning session that I was sitting in at one time, and the product owner desperately wanted to be able to do um, French localization in that release. So she came to the table and said, I need French localization. The architect, right, this is why we have to have an architectural roadmap, is sitting there telling her, I have no idea how to implement um, uh, uh, the uh, localization stuff in this particular release. I have no idea if it will fit. So there was a willingness to bring in spikes to be able to deal with that, but we still had no notion if we could um, commit within the release to be able to deal with that. If we had had a longer term product roadmap and we could have looked into quarter two or quarter three and said, hey, this, this idea of French localization is coming, we need to pull some things forward to mitigate the risk of being able to deliver that in a subsequent quarter. So by doing enough forward planning to understand where our business risks and technical risks live so that we can start to figure out the things that we know and the things that we don't know, identify those risks and put them on the plan, then we can introduce this notion of release spikes. So in any given release, any given planning horizon, we will have a release backlog that is made up of these epics that are broken down into features, that are broken down into user stories. And then because we understand the risks in the upcoming quarter, we can pull just enough work ahead into the current quarter to mitigate the risk and to increase the understanding that's going to happen in the next quarter. Okay, and so there's this balance, right? So we're not really talking about big upfront waterfall planning. You know, epics and features and user stories still meet the invest criteria. They're still contained. We're still minimizing dependencies. We're still doing all the stuff that we would do with user stories. We just want to understand them just a little further ahead so we can start this um, exercising this notion of pulling risk into earlier releases to stabilize the future releases. 
just to give you guys another quick story. was working with the team last summer, and we, we implemented all this stuff. And just like a lot of teams, they, you know, in their first release, they, they got everything broken down. They had pulled some, they had understood their upcoming release, and they pulled some spikes forward. Well, then the work that was in the current quarter, um, you know, got bigger than they had expected. And the first thing that was they wanted to pull out was this notion of the release level spikes. When they did that, the challenge was they got to the next release planning horizon and they hadn't sufficiently risk reduced that backlog and they had no idea what it was that they were going to build. So this whole destable kind of um, unable to plan metaphor um, you know, just carried forward into the next release. So we have to be disciplined in every release boundary, every quarter that we need to maintain some capacity for doing the work that's going to help the next release be stable. You guys will you hear me say this a thousand times if you ever get to meet me, is, is predictability is absolutely the key. Executives and organizations, they want adaptability, they want good quality, they want to be able to change their mind and figure it out as we go, but at some level, We've got to get to a place with Agile where we can start talking about how to make and meet commitments, even if it's a two-week commitment, even if it's a three-month commitment, even if it's kind of a three- to six-month rolling plan. This notion of pulling risk forward so that we can adequately address the unknowns in the backlog so that when we get to the planning horizon, whether it be sprint or whether it be at the release boundary, that we've adequately risk-reduced um, and can actually make a commitment at that level. Again, right, at scale, um, at the team level, making and meeting commitments um, a little bit further in advance isn't as important. When I'm coordinating across multiple teams in a complex enterprise, the notion of being able to reliably hit a milestone date um, is, is huge. It's just absolutely huge. Again, not talking 18, 24 months out, talking on about a three to six month kind of rolling wave plan. Okay, so that's a huge um, part of what we're going for here. And so one thing that I almost cheated up on a little bit <clears throat> on one of the earlier slides is this notion <clears throat> of budgeting versus estimating. So one of the things that I've found is that especially at scale, especially when I'm dealing with multiple team agile um, programs, the idea of being able to put a reliable estimate around something is almost impossible. I mean, I mean, you guys live this stuff every day. Um, it's hard enough to accurately estimate a sprint, let alone a release, let alone an integrated 12-month program um, doing Agile. So one of the strategies we talk about, and I want to tie a couple of ideas here together, is when I'm putting a budget around um, an, uh, an epic up at that top layer of the diagram that's on the screen, at the point that I've sat down with my architect and I've, and I've talked about where it fits in my roadmap and the kinds of technologies that are involved, and I put a swag on it, you know, at that point, that, that estimate is no longer an estimate. That estimate is actually a budget. And I think this is a huge thing that we need to start talking about. At the enterprise level, estimating is a part of it. We need to know that if it's bigger than a bread box or if it's an extra large or, or what have you. But at the point that we put a number on it and we've allocated capacity to it and we expect there to be an ROI associated with it, that is now our budget. So as we're decomposing the features and we're decomposing the user stories and coming up with these spikes and reducing risk, we absolutely have to have a collaboration between, um, at the higher levels, the architects and the business. Because at that point, we're no longer trying to figure out how big is it. We know how big it needs to be to be profitable. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what user stories and what features we can actually put into the backlog to make that epic level commitment a reality. Okay? It's a really different way of thinking about it. So if I say that this epic is going to take five teams time between now and the end of the quarter, as I'm decomposing those user stories, I'm not trying to figure out everything that I would like to build. I'm trying to figure out what is absolutely minimally marketable to be able to make that commitment a reality. I think that is just a huge paradigm shift that, um, that we need to start thinking about, again, especially with Agile at scale. What solution can we deliver that can be um, realized within the time and cost constraints that we've established? Okay, so now 
we've really kind of um, you know trod some some kind of well-known ground, but introduced some some interesting ideas, right? So we've introduced the idea of of team level agility and why in a portfolio program context that stability and stable velocity is so much more important than it is at the single team level. We've introduced the idea of release planning and road mapping, pretty well understood concepts, but we've kind of up the ante a little bit. We've talked about the idea of budgeting versus estimating and collaboratively um, in a partnership between business and technology working together to make sure that we're identifying the right technology solutions and the right set of requirements that will make our program and portfolio level commitments a reality. Okay, so the third view that I want to talk about is this notion of flow, <laughs> and we're going to get into a discussion around bottlenecks and constraints and things like that. So if you guys, um, so again, just a couple of key concepts we're going to do here is we're going to talk about flow, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to introduce Kanban, I'm assuming you guys are, are probably at least passingly familiar with the notion of Kanban, talk about value streams a little bit, the, the importance of small batch sizes and, um, and WIP limits, okay? So um, if you guys will remember, um, when we got up to the enterprise portfolio model, we had been talking about project um, program portfolio and enterprise portfolio, we really kind of implied that most organizations have three layers within them. Some organizations have two if they're smaller. Some of the large ones we work with might have four or five layers in their integrated portfolio model. But each of those layers operates on a different um, uh, level of abstraction within the requirement space. So let me let me see if I can explain this a little bit. This is a little tough to untangle, so so bear with me. So at the lowest level, right, going back to where the Scrum teams are, kind of at the project management level, you know, this is your typical Scrum board. This is this is where stories go and they get broken down into tasks and where we're trying to establish stable velocity. But what I'm suggesting is that at the program level. We're not really dealing with velocity and sprints or even release boundaries as much anymore. What we're really dealing with is a flow of features into the product. Now, we may batch that flow of features into um, various releases, but things are going to live in different states of analysis and design before they get built and tested, integrated, and deployed. The third tier can be represented um, also with a Kanban. Um, I love being a little bit provocative on these slides. So you notice my nice little waterfall um, value stream there in the middle, kind of my RUP um, value stream up at the top. Because what I want to do is I want to highlight the fact that we're really um, thinking about these requirements in different levels of their, of their maturation. So let's tie it back to another graphic that you guys have seen. So here was our story map graphic and our, you know, we, we talked about the idea of minimally marketable features. So now let's marry these two. So the tier one, the scrum guys, they're operating off of user stories, right? They're doing user stories, they're doing sprints, all that good stuff. The middle tier, this is where the, the, the um, program level lives. This is where your product owners and your, your solutions architects kind of live in a complex enterprise. I think this is where your project managers and your program managers live um, are in this middle tier. Their primary concern is features and getting features through analysis and design, build, test, and deploy. If I wanted to use more agile language in that middle, I might say envisioning and story mapping, um, uh, you know, building uh, integration and then release or something like that. Um, some of the companies we work with will we'll put intermediate cues like ready for release and you know, ready for build is, is kind of holding cues in, in these upper level Kanbans. At the top layer, this is where the epics live. Because you think at the epic, the top tier, that's where we're dealing with the portfolio stuff. So now this is where your executives or your senior leaders are getting together and deciding which, um, which initiatives are going to um, get approved and put into the backlog. This is where your PMO more than likely lives. Okay, so now we're really getting into kind of the operational, how do I feed projects or um, programs into the portfolio queue for approval, ultimately get them decomposed, that's the middle tier, and ultimately get them executed. So this is a really powerful pattern for being able to visualize where all of the work in your enterprise system is at and what state of maturity, therefore what level of commitment, what level of release readiness um, that I can reasonably expect um, to see. So now what we're trying to do is we're using this notion of Kanban, that's what we fundamentally introduced here, 
to create a, a portfolio and program level pull system across the entire organization that's limited by your actual capacity to deliver. Okay. Again, another huge challenge is that most organizations have very little ability to figure out what it is that they can actually do and what their release capacity is. So if the whole system is throttled by the ability of the teams to deliver, now we can start looking at you know, where are our bottlenecks, where are our, our dependencies, where do we need to add resources, how do we need to manage the overall um, delivery system. Okay, so if you think about it, so an Epic comes into that top level, and the portfolio team, that cross-functional portfolio team that could be made up of your enterprise architect, your chief product owner, or it could be made up of a bunch of vice presidents, I mean, lots of companies are different. Their job is to move these large investment increments through um, <clears throat> business planning, through technical planning, through construction, through transition. They might not actually do all that work. They might be like the gatekeepers in a, in a PMO at that level, but their job is to shepherd these epics through the enterprise um, portfolio model. So as things move into like a discovery phase, like a, like a RUP elaboration, then features get identified. Um, as the product owner or the program teams um, identify the features, their job is to get the features through the system as fast as they can. So then things move into like a design or a story mapping or some collaborative JAD session, whatever you want to call it, right? And then as a result of that, that creates spikes in user stories that the teams consume. Okay, so each level is responsible for doing whatever is necessary to move their work across the board. So at the team level, we're breaking things down into tasks and we're moving tasks across the board. That creates pulls for features. Features move across the board into test and ultimately into deploy. New um, epics can move into inception and then move into elaboration and construction and also ultimately into um, transition. Okay, so what we're basically doing is that this third view is in effect kind of the feeder system for all of the user stories that are actually going to get executed down at the team level. Okay, so we may still be doing release level commits. We may still be thinking about what is ready to schedule into release, what has been sufficiently risk reduced, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we're visualizing it in a board that looks um, something like this. In a complex enterprise, you might actually envision this board more like um, the diagram we had. There could be one board for the top level. Each program team could have its own board. And of course, each scrum team is going to have um, its own board. Now you'll notice I upped the complexity of this um, diagram just a little bit. Because as these epics run through and as these features go through in an enterprise, the user stories and the spikes might actually go out to more than one team. Okay, it might take more, maybe like in a services oriented uh, kind of uh, architecture, maybe the feature level is actually what the product is, but the user stories are going out and getting um, farmed out to various services teams um, to provide certain other capabilities um, into the product. What we find sometimes is that we end up with bottlenecks and dependencies when that happens. This work has to be, um, you know, sequenced and it has to be aware. So there's kind of two things that we're wrestling against here. We're going to use release planning to the integrated release planning we talked about and those kind of quarterly dependencies to try to sequence some of that stuff out and to make sure that we've got some sort of rationalization, especially within the current quarter. But the other thing we're going to do is we're going to put work and process limits on these various queues. So the, the, the challenge that we're trying to face is if one of those scrum teams down at the bottom becomes a bottleneck, that's going to ultimately block a feature from moving maybe from build to test or from test to deploy. Um, if, if enough features get bottlenecked at the build and test area, that might create a blockage up at the elaboration phase or the construction phase in the portfolio. So if you'll see what we're doing is we're blending several ways of looking at uh, the enterprise portfolio. We've got the team level performance, absolutely essential. We've got the roadmap view and the release planning view, if you will. But we're also maintaining this flow of value view because at the end of the day, if we get really mature at this stuff, I would make a case that we might even be able to drop the second view in lieu of a pure 
kind of enterprise Kanban um, flow of value view. And then our metrics are things like cycle time and standard deviation. And the idea of even batching anything up into a release level commitment could actually go away. Okay, but I think this is a really interesting transition pattern and, and pretty useful as far as helping organizations visualize um, the work that they've got going on in the system and where everything is and the level of certainty associated with it. As you might imagine, the stuff to the left at every level is way less certain than the stuff to the right. So if I'm an exec, I, I don't make commitments on things that are in inception elaboration. But if it's in construction, it's been slotted for release, it's been risk reduced, I understand the transition plan, then that's something that I can start talking about in market. As a product owner, I'm probably not doing a ton of making commitments around things that are in analysis and design, but things that are in build and test, um, and again, have been slotted into a release boundary, can absolutely start talking about those things. And so it allows me to see all the work, where it's at, and then the relationships between the user story stuff, the feature stuff, and the inception stuff can all be um, kind of tied together, which leads me to my next view. And for you guys, Agile purists out there, um, you might not like this one. I'm just warning you in advance. Um, I really think that there is a role for a kind of Gantt chart-oriented view, as long as it's um, being... Uh, used in the right way, I guess is what I want to say. So so things like understanding the planned start and the planned end for a given epic, understanding that budget associated with the epic, understanding what our, our kind of wild guess was associated with the epic, being able to um, understand what the estimates, the actuals, the percent complete was, I think is a very powerful way of being able to communicate with our leaders what it is that we're actually doing and where it's at in the process. So if I look at just like a real simple decomposition, so you notice I'm using trying to use the same visual metaphors to tie this stuff together. So we've got epics that break down into features, that break down into user stories. Um, the tooling that is available to us will show us progress against the user stories. Okay, so we can see um, a percent complete of the tasks against a given user story. Not as useful necessarily, right, because user stories happen pretty quick. But as features are getting complete, it's useful to be able to see how far are we along in being able to deliver that feature. We want to be able to see how far are we along at being able to um, produce an epic. So, you know, we might understand the budget for the, ec the epic. What, is the, what do we expect it to take? And then we might have an estimate that actually rolls up to um, what our actual decomposition summed up to. So we know that we have, in this particular case, an extra 20 points of capacity or something. You know, then we might have a detail that says, okay, this is how long it actually took. And our planned start and planned end for this epic is between sprint one and sprint five. And you can see that kind of decomposition at every level. So again, we're marrying four different views. We've got the team level view. We've got the release view, which is pretty useful in terms of roadmaps and um, rolling wave planning and progressive elaboration. We've got the flow view, which is the, you know, the enterprise Kanban boards. And then we've got what I like to call the progress view. How are we actually doing against this stuff and how are our estimates and details detailed roll-ups, um, mapping to the budgets that we had in initially intended to uh, spend, and how, how well are we doing against actually um, the, the, the high-level commits that, that we've talked about to our, our senior-level leaders, okay? So these four views absolutely work. They absolutely tie together and can provide a ton of um, you know, knowledge and insight into how an integrated portfolio is, is actually performing, okay? So we can just kind of see at every single level um, how each of the, the items that we're tracking, um, it works. So, so again, right, just kind of pulling it all together, and then I'm going to, you know, give it about a minute, and then I'll, uh, and then we'll stop, and I'll try to answer some questions for you guys. But just in kind of recap, um, some of the stuff that we're talking about just absolutely does not play if we can't get the organization structured around teams at all these different levels. So every team, whether it be a scrum team, a program team, or a portfolio team, is a cross-functional entity that is responsible for delivering against its value stream. So now that we have a little bit more um, words and language around this, so the Scrum team is responsible for the, hey, we're going we're gonna to define it, we're going to build it, we're going to test it, we're going to make it ready. The um, program level team is responsible for maybe the, the roadmap 
layer and all of that progressive elaboration stuff in the middle. So we have a cross-functional team at that level that's doing a lot of the, the analysis and the breakdown and understanding and managing the dependencies and sequencing the work. And then we've got a cross-functional team at the top level that's probably made up of executives or enterprise architects or the different functional silos within the organization that are collaborating to approve projects and to get the teams what they need to be successful. They're responding to the bottlenecks and the constraints and the block cues underneath them. Right? They're the enablement part of the organization that's, that's providing the, the, the money or the time or whatever it means to be able to get this out. Right? So we've got to have a transformation that, that structures an organization in this way. They have to understand their practices and they have to be willing to work this way. Right? It's a different mindset um, of, of execution. We've got to mature the practices. We've got to start being willing to plan at different levels of scale. And then again, right, we have to understand what the what the, the execution structure of the organization looks like. I don't necessarily care the management structure of the organization, but this is really an execution framework for being able to um, deliver work this way. So then we have our four views. We've got our team level view where we take our story maps, our minimally marketable, we stabilize the teams, we start taking a little bit of a longer planning horizon. We're willing to roadmap out um, a little further than maybe we are today. Um, we know that we want really fine-grained detail in the current release horizon, maybe a little bit of an idea of what's happening in the next, and we realize that Q2 and Q3 are a little bit more of a crapshoot. But the idea is, is that in this case, we really want to be intentional about pulling risk forward. If we can't get to a place where we're identifying risk proactively and we're putting work into the backlog, stories into the backlog to deal with that risk, our delivery cadence and our ability to integrate across teams is never going to stabilize. So maybe if there's just one or two things I want you to take away, this is one of them. Just enough forward planning to identify risks and to plan to mitigate those risks in either earlier sprints or earlier releases is absolutely huge. Another big takeaway, the idea of budgeting at the epic level and making sure that that program team in the middle is collaborating on the right set of requirements and the implementation such that um, it's not an accident as to whether we're on time or not. The technology decisions and the requirements decisions should be very intentional the trade-off should be made at that middle tier level to make that top tier commitment a reality. Again, I think that's the only way that this stuff works at scale. So here's our visualization, right? This, this kind of a model gives senior leaders a ton of power to be able to communicate with their stakeholders about where the organization is at and its, um, and its, uh, its, its uh, maturity in, in terms of delivering some of these products. It's incredibly powerful to be able to say, hey, these two things that you've requested, they're an inception or elaboration. We haven't fully decomposed them. We don't understand them. We're not committing to them yet. But you know what? By the time it's in construction, um, we know that it's been sequenced for a release. We know that it's been risk reduced. We know we've got a team of people that are dialing the knobs all the time to make it a reality. And, and we get a high degree of confidence when we can start committing to this stuff. And then if we start getting really mature with this kind of a view and we start thinking about you know measuring cycle time on different sized epics and understanding um, you know uh, you know our cumulative flow and where things are at in their various states we can really start managing um, around even the release level batches and we can start getting into a continuous flow of value into market kind of approach and um, when Mary Poppendike heard me do this talk um, at Agile 2012, she came rushing up afterwards and she goes, you know what, if you're really doing all those metrics and stuff in Kanban, you don't need this view. And I'm like, I totally agree with you. But right now, um, where a lot of organizations are, this view can be a really interesting bridge back to a traditional PMO. It can give um, senior leaders a ton of confidence. And I believe that it's actually pragmatically useful for helping to understand where we're at against plan. One of the big problems problems with Gantt charts to date is that they're used as a hammer, right? They're used as, a, as the statement of reality, the baseline that we have to make happen. I'm totally okay using something like this as a constraint or something to understand what we're targeting, but at the end of the day, we have to let that execution level stuff at the team level and at the program level inform that portfolio level view of where we're supposed to be and when. And as long as the, the, the engine underneath is, is informing and updating uh, and, and it's being used in conjunction with the other views, um, I think it's actually a, a pretty healthy view um, that, that we can use. So with that, um, I think I need a sip of coffee and take a breath for a minute. And Claire, I'm going to hand it over to you, and we can try to answer some questions for 10 minutes or so. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mike. You did a really superb job of taking a complex topic and making it extremely digestible. So much appreciated. Thank you. Before we dive into the Q&A session with Mike, I would like to introduce you all to Andy Powell, our product evangelist here at version one. In next week's webinar, Andy will be building on the concepts that Mike has shared with us today and showing us how to implement them using version one. Andy, would you like to take a quick moment to share what you'll be covering in your session next week? Yeah, first off, I'd just like to say, Mike, uh, great job today. I think uh, just looking at the questions coming through, everyone found it really valuable. Cool. And as, as Mike talked about, uh, you know, to really get this all working, um, it starts at the team level, and that's kind of where version one's roots are. Uh, but program and portfolio become really essential if you're going to scale Agile. And so uh, we'll be walking through a lot of the concepts that Mike went through, and I hope to see you guys next week. Thanks, Andy. So, yep, so the reminder there is it's a week from now, same time, and you can use your same webinar access details um, to join the session. So we hope to see as many as possible of you as possible um, next week. So on to some Q&A. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes to uh, okay. do a few questions. Um, before I, I, I do start asking any of the, some of the questions we've received, given the volume of questions we've received, um, both in advance of this webinar and also during the webinar, we are also going to try something a little new um, after the event to keep the discussion going um, using an online forum. So we will be sending you an invite um, to join our Agile Managers Forum after this event. Um, and that way, you'll have the opportunity to share any additional questions, thoughts, and also learn from the opi opinions and experiences for others. So after we wrap things up here, please do look out for an email invite. Um, it will come from Andrea Keeble at version 1. And once you accept the invite, um, like I say, you'll be able to join in on further discussion threads around this topic. So let's take a look at some of the questions we've received. Um, so Mike, the, one of the, the questions actually a few people have asked is, are there any or many case studies of organizations who have been implementing this model and being successful with it? Yeah. So, so I'll tell you, you know, I, I get asked that question quite a bit. Um, one of the, the way that I answer it first is that a lot of this stuff quite frankly, is, is being invented. I mean, if you think about um, where Agile was at 10 years ago, 12 years ago now when the manifesto was signed, um, those guys will, will tell you they were solving a different class of problem. Um, they were solving what we, what we call in our practice the small team problem. How do I effectively get product out the door with, you know, a handful of people, right? Team level agile scrum, absolutely um, essential for that. Um, what you're starting to see now over just the last few years is, is an understanding of the different tiers and Kanban and how all this stuff works together. Um, I just previewed a, a paper that was being written by a government agency talking about um, you know, some of these concepts and their application into the DOD. Um, you know, there's anecdotal stuff that's starting to come out of some of the various consultancies that are out there. People are starting to write about it. There's a few books um, that are describing these patterns. But are there like formal peer-reviewed case studies um, with this stuff exactly? I don't think I don't think there are yet. I think that I think we're going to have to start developing some of that to make it credible. But as it stands right now, I, there's just not a lot that's on my radar that I could point you to. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't be more helpful there. Thanks, Mike. One of the questions that again came through a lot in the in the questions that we received prior um, to the webinar, and again also during, is a lot of folks seem to be juggling. Um, some agile and some kind of traditional approaches to project yeah. management and asking yeah. is it possible to blend those two and how does it all fit together if you know, they're not complete? Yeah, so, so a lot of my early thinking on this came out of some work that I was doing um, with, with one of my last like full-time job kind of companies um, before starting Leading Agile. And, uh, and so, so one of the things that when I talk about blending, I would say there's two kinds of blending. There's an integration of like let's say an agile track with a waterfall track, 
Okay, and if you're if you're in kind of a pure play agile space, and you need to integrate with a waterfall space. A lot of the concepts that I was talking about here will really really help you out. Because one of the things that drives the waterfall guys crazy is that the agile guys never want to commit to anything. And one of the things that drives the agile guys crazy is that the waterfall guys want everything planned out um, in advance. And so. Um, when you look at this kind of lean flow of value and you're willing to take a little bit of a further kind of planning horizon and you're willing to understand time and cost and varying scope to meet certain constraints, um, you can marry those two tracks together pretty well. Um, what, I, what I really don't like when you talk about blending Agile and Waterfall is when you're doing like little, little mini waterfalls in a sprint. Okay, so, so if, you're just, if, you, if you have Agile tracks and Waterfall tracks, absolutely it, it's hard, right? It's a non-trivial problem, but, but those things can coexist and those folks can work together as long as everybody understands how the other one works and they're not like, you know, throwing darts at each other. It's when you start um, kind of changing the rules of Agile um, because you don't have the right collaboration or the org structure or everything where I get a little squirmy. Again, hope that answers your question, um, but that's typically how I think about it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. There seems to be a little bit of confusion um, between the understanding of epics, features, and stories, and how you make sure that sort of senior management, management and executives have the same understanding as a team member, and if um, like a portfolio level epic, yeah, how it yeah. all ties together in that from a sizing perspective. Yeah, so so the the language epic feature user story is somewhat arbitrary. Other people use different stuff. I've heard themes, epics, and stories. Um, you know, again, I've heard epic themes, stories, right? So really, all we're really talking about is big stuff, um, or bigger stuff, medium sized stuff, and small stuff. So my choice of words is again somewhat arbitrary. It, again, how I teach and coach is that I like to try to get the biggest chunks to be about two to three months. The reason why I like the biggest chunks to be two to three months is because they fit kind of neatly in a release or maybe it'll span one release, but they're things that have pretty quick start and finishes. They meet the same kind of criteria as the as what we talk about with user stories. They have a defined beginning and end, right? They have a definition of done. They have an acceptance criteria. One of the things that we've been talking about is, is putting acceptance criteria on every single level. So to answer the question directly, if an epic has an acceptance criteria and a definition of done, and a feature has an acceptance criteria and a definition of done, and a user story does, and all of that stuff rolls up, um, well then, then absolutely, right? I mean, that's a way to kind of encourage that, that shared understanding. And the other thing just to keep in mind is that whenever you're drawing stuff like this, it's very easy to kind of draw all the circles separate and all the tiers is silos. Um, at every level, you expect these to operate almost like Venn diagrams. So the people at the portfolio level are working very hand-in-hand -hand with the people at the program level. The program level people are working very hand-in-hand -hand with the people at the team. And, and so again, right, the structures you want them to be incredibly collaborative. It's just that the business agility isn't at the sprint level. The business agility is at the is it the integrating of multiple teams and deliverables every two to three months at the epic level. Right? So we want flow at the epic level, which means we have to focus on getting things done before we get them started. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there was a question too about swag and how you estimate if the stories aren't there yet? Yeah, it's interesting, right? So um, it just depends on, so, so the two ideas that I want to talk about is that, so at, so at an epic level, I don't know who in that person's company would be doing this, but there's somebody that is kind of setting the roadmap. You're having a conversation um, of two or three people, or maybe it's eight people, where we're saying, in general, what is this epic? And then we're saying, you know, in general, what kinds of technology impacts might that imply? And there's this very organic conversation that also um, encompasses um, what do we know, what do we not know, um, how much are we willing to invest in this? Okay, and the idea is if we understand generally how big it is, is it bigger than a bread box, is it smaller than a bus, whatever, um, and we understand at some level the technologies that are involved, and we understand what we're willing to invest in it, and what the ROI that we're expecting out of it is, then what that will do is that will guide the creation of the user stories. So when I talk about that being a budget, 
I, I agree. There's no way to know exactly how big it is unless every user story is understood, unless every technical design thing is understood. I might caveat that it's probably still wrong even if you knew all that stuff. But what I'm suggesting is that if we have the right collaboration between the business and the technology people, and we've had this conversation, and we all come to the table with a willingness to work together to maximize our economic outcomes, the ROI associated with that feature, that epic, then what we can do is we can make the appropriate trade-offs as we go to make sure that we're getting the business agility at the top layer. Which is why I started the conversation by saying, if your business and technology people aren't willing to work together in cross-functional teams, and they're not willing to come together in this kind of flow of value mentality, right, that's a really, that's a tough problem to solve. You almost have to tackle that before you can implement a process like I'm talking about today. Okay, thanks, Mike. And it looks like we're coming right up to the hour. Um, so I'll finish off with a question, which I think will okay. tie in very nicely with uh, Andy's webinar next week. But there have been a few questions around how you support this whole process using a tool um, and just how uh, how it will kind of support implementing yeah. it. Um, I don't know if you could yeah. have a couple of thoughts on that just to, to close up. So to give a little plug for, for version one, um, you know, we've done a little bit of work um, with version one, um, kind of partnering with them to help them understand some of what it is. Uh, not, okay, sorry, I said that wrong. Really helping get the, get some of these ideas incorporated into the tool. Um, you know, version one has a capability called Epic Boards that will help you visualize kind of the Kanban views that we're talking about. Um, some of the Epic Tree decomposition stuff will help with that last view that, that we implemented. Um, clearly version one has all of the team stuff absolutely nailed. Um, there's road mapping features and ways of tying roadmaps to Epics and um, there's some neat new functionality in the last release or two about visualizing the Epics and showing progress. And so the, the tooling is keeping up nicely with um, the thinking around this. Inevitably, the thinking can involve faster than the tools, but um, they're, they're pretty much right in sync right now, and I think Andy's going to close that gap next week when he shows you how to do all this stuff in version one. Fantastic. Well, thank you once again, Mike, for your time and expertise today. Thank you to everybody for joining us today, and please you know, do join the Agile Managers Forum. We'll keep this discussion going, and we hope to see you again next week when Andy presents on version one. Thank you so much. Thanks, Claire.